Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the Great Dynamics podcast. My name is Ahmed Hassan. Today we have a, a little bit of a different one. We decided to bring out one of our workshops as our podcast. And uh, this is a workshop that we did a couple of weeks ago on how to write a killer intelligence report. People have been asking where to find it. So we decided to make this into an episode. Please enjoy. If you want to see the video with the slide deck, it will be on YouTube. It's mainly Marcel who will be going through it. And uh, I think I'll do maybe a, a brief intro. Thank you guys and uh, enjoy the show. One last thing that I need to add is that from today, which is Black Friday till Cyber Monday, which is next Monday, midnight, we will launch our individual courses separately for the first time and they'll be discounted uh, use the code bf2024 to have more than 50 dollar discount on the uh, courses uh, normally is it 250 and right now they're 497 each and after this they will still be available for 250 uh, we've listened to your comments and we've listened to your advice that you've given us so we've decided to bring them out separately and hopefully you guys get a chance to to enjoy the courses thank you and see you in the next one bye welcome everyone to this presentation on writing a killer intelligence report we decided to do this as the first topic of our webinars and hopefully we'll do a whole bunch more because it should be fairly straightforward to write an intelligence report, but there are surprisingly few resources for it. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you if you Google how to write an intelligence report, you will get stuff. But what you tend to get is very specific information or very niche information. So uh, one of the one of the big things is you'll see is uh, how to write a intelligence report for the army, also known as an interrep. And that's not necessarily what most intelligence reports look like. And if you're someone who, you know, intends to join the U.S. Army, uh, they will teach you how to write an interrupt. So the, the idea here is that to talk about sort of the elements that go into an intelligence report outside of one specific context, talk about some of the general concepts, information that goes into an intelligence report and uh, move sort of move on from there. And hopefully, you know, whether you're someone who's new to intelligence or someone who's been working in intelligence for a while, you know, go in with a, with a better appreciation of the elements that go into any of the, the intelligence reports that you're writing. So I'm going to start off with introductions. So Ahmed, I'll let you uh, introduce yourself first. Oh, thank you. So everybody, my name is Ahmed Hassan. I'm uh, the CEO and, and founder of Great Dynamics. Uh, and my background is in, in human intelligence and in a counterterrorism setting. I mainly worked in Africa, but originally I'm from Somalia, but I grew up in the Netherlands. So, uh, and now I'm some undisclosed locations in the Nordics. And the course actually talking about intelligence writing, that's not my course. It's just that Marcel was just better at making these types of presentations than I am. So, but yeah, thank you all for coming. I, I'm so excited to have you guys on. And for people that listen to the podcast, you probably know my voice. Just maybe you haven't seen my face before. So thank you again. Welcome and uh, and enjoy. Marcel. We oui. Yeah. So uh, I'm Marcel Plichta. I'm the lead instructor of the Great Dynamics Intelligence School. My history with intelligence uh, started when I got out of my master's degree. I, like many people starting in intelligence, particularly for the U.S. government, started as a contractor working for uh, the FBI on counterterrorism stuff. I then left because I was more interested in less of the domestic kind of, kinds of things that the FBI deals with and more international intelligence issues. So I moved to the Department of Defense first as a contractor, and then I was hired as an intelligence officer. And the entire time I was there, I was doing the role of an intelligence analyst. The last thing I did before I left government service was uh, working at the Joint Staff J2. So uh, my work there was to support the chairman's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, the senior figures in the U.S. military, with intelligence products and intelligence reports, which is a very fast-paced environment where you learn very quickly uh, what sort of elements go into uh, good intelligence reports and what elements go into to other related skills like briefing. 
And since then, I've been doing work with Gray Dynamics and, uh, and other intelligence work on a freelance basis. Uh, so now that we've got our introductions out of the way, uh, I will proceed. The first thing to understand when it comes to intelligence reports, right, is, is like, what's, what's the point of an intelligence report? And the point of an intelligence report, and it seems simple, but it's something that should sort of cut through every single part of writing an intelligence report, is that you are writing that intelligence report for someone else to read, right? Um, the audience for an intelligence report, the people who are going to read it, are called intelligence consumers or intelligence customers, depending on um, which, which sort of organizations you came up in. Some people refer to them as customers. Uh, usually in sort of academic context, you say consumers because customer makes it sound like there's a like a monetary transaction, and that's not necessarily the case. Uh, so just to avoid confusion, I'll probably be saying consumer or reader for the rest. But these are interchangeable terms for our purposes. And the point of your intelligence report is to give these consumers uh, what's called decision advantage. And what that means is the people who are reading your reports are usually policymakers or managers, right? And this can be anyone from, you know, the the prime minister of of a country uh, to, you know, someone who oversees a, you know, oversees aid or, uh, you know, a, a minor, a minor policy, right? These people are, as part of their role, making decisions every day, lots of little decisions, and they usually need intelligence to support those decisions. So really, the point of your intelligence report is to get your analysis and your, uh, your assessments and your evidence to the reader, uh, to the intelligence consumer, so that they can go and make a decision that's hopefully, hopefully informed, right? And a lot of the trick to intelligence analysis is making sure that the final report or the intelligence product that you give to them is, is actually useful when it comes to that decision-making process. So without further ado, I'm going to, I organized this from basically from front to, from the start of the report to the end of the report. Uh, so we're going to proceed in order here. But before that, we need to talk about, is there a right way to do an intelligence report? And the short answer is no. There's no one master secret template that, that if you follow this, your report's going to be perfect. You know, intelligence reports are made to fit your intelligence consumer. So your reports are going to look different depending on who the individual you're writing your intelligence report for or which organization you're a part of or which organization you're writing it for. Often certain individuals respond better to some, some parts of intelligence reports, some lengths of report than others. And sometimes, you know, if you move from one organization to another, those organizations will have different things they want to do with their reports or they'll have different templates that they want you to follow as an analyst. That said, most intelligence reports share a common set of elements, just just because that's that's how you would inform someone, um, and so that's what we're going to go through uh, step by step and talk about, you know, the decisions you can make in terms of having one element in your report or having another element in your report. So, the first thing we're going to talk about is the front matter of a report, and I would say I would say this is probably the least exciting part because it's not really the meat of your report. It's it's not necessarily the content of your report. But what it is, is it's the first thing that the person reading your report sees. So you have to make sure that you're giving, you know, your intelligence consumer the, the right information with your front matter. And I'm going to go through three, three examples of things to put there. Uh, the first is labels and, you know, labels and banners, right? And those will be at the very top. Occasionally, they'll be at the very bottom. But, you know, we're, we're, for, the sake of, um, for the sake of this, we'll say, you know, put, putting the labels at the top. And the purpose there is to indicate the kinds of report it is and, and restrictions on distribution. So when I say the kinds of report, you know, if, if you're talking about a geographic location, if you're talking about, you know, a, a, certain, a certain, like a forecast, for instance, a forecast or an alternative analysis, you know, that's where, that's where you would put it in the label because that way when the reader looks at it, it's the first thing they see, they understand something about uh, the intelligence product. The restrictions on distribution uh, in government contexts, I think that's probably the example everyone knows, right, is classifications, right? So at the top, you know, you would have, uh, you know, if it's, a, if it's a NATO or a U.S. government product, you know, you'd have your classification on top, like, you know, secret or top secret or something like that. But a lot of private sector companies also have uh, restrictions on distribution, right? Like if they have their own proprietary information or if they have some, some you know, some other kind of agreement. It governs uh, who in the company right gets gets access uh, to this information. So, 
it's always good to get that right and it's always good to pay attention to that you wouldn't want to you wouldn't want to mess that up because you would you might you know accidentally give someone uh, access to information that they shouldn't have or access to your report and it's good for um you know uh, reading other people's reports because you get a better understanding of what they're trying to convey uh now the next is the title right and uh you don't need to go crazy with the title in intelligence reports you know it's not you're not writing you know like an article for a tabloid or something like that what you need to do is explain the purpose of the report and give them a reason to keep reading you have a little bit more leeway with this if you are writing for an intelligence report for uh, a government or certain private sector clients usually the understanding is that they're already interested and excited about the topic of your intelligence report. So you, you don't need to do much more than describe it. In instances where you're writing uh, in a competitive environment, right, where the person who's reading your intelligence report doesn't necessarily have to be reading it, right? And maybe there are other competing intelligence reports or outside articles or other information that they're dealing with and they're busy, you know, you might have to catch their eye. Um, and this is especially the case for contexts like ours, where uh, at Great Dynamics, we write a good deal of our reports and our articles for the public. So the idea is that in that case, the public is the intelligence consumer. And so uh, we, are, we are sort of trying to get, trying to get your attention, right, uh, through our titles. Often in the private sector, this comes through uh, a bunch of different uh, tricks, right, like uh, search engine optimization. I'm not going to get into too many of the details of that, but basically that's about trying to find trying to trying to make it easier to find the report on Google, right? So if you've written a report about Libya and the intention the intention is to get as many eyes on it as possible, right? Uh, you would try and you would try and have a title that um, when someone Googles uh, Libya and then whatever your specific issue is, they would find your report. And that's more of a thing for for public sector stuff, but it is important to know. Um, and it's it's uh, something that is increasingly important for public facing uh, intelligence shops. The last one here is sort of a sort of a hail mary. I said probability yardstick and methodology here. We're gonna we're gonna describe both of these in more detail below. But basically, probability yardsticks kind of serve as a as a guide to how the analyst is going to use words like likely and probably. It assigns a, a value to them. So if I say something is likely to happen, that could mean you know sixty sixty five percent that uh, that it will happen. And then the other example is methodology, right? If you're doing something special with this report, like you're doing a you're doing a forecast, or you're doing um, uh, you're you're taking an approach that isn't common for for an intelligence report. The whole point is to give this stuff to the reader up front, so that they have context for the rest of your report. If you if you came in with this uh, with a sort of a wacky methodology, or if you came in with um, specific terminology or, or phrases, if they don't already know what it is, they'll probably be confused reading your report. And you can always, you know, take this stuff and put it in an annex at the end of the report, right, uh, further down. But if they need to know this information to understand the approach you're taking with the report or how you're going about things, it's best to have that um, up sort of at the outset, even if it's in sort of a shorter form. So is a quick example of the front matter of a report. This is a actual declassified uh, intelligence report. It's a DID, also known as the Defense Intelligence Digest, made by the U.S. Department of Defense. And this particular one was written in March 2020. And you can see several, several examples of why the front matter matters here, right? Um, on the top left, you have the crest of the Defense Intelligence Agency, so you know who wrote it. On the top right, uh, you have both the what it was classified as at the time, and that's been xed out and since declassified, um, which is also useful to know because if, you know, in the future, if you're working with information that came from a government, it's, it's important to know that it has properly been declassified. You wouldn't want to accidentally uh, work with leaked information. And then we have what we, and then we have what, uh, what I was talking about in terms of uh, labels and titles worldwide there is an example of like you of like establishing where we are geographically in most products, right? It wouldn't, it wouldn't, in most intelligence reports, it wouldn't be like worldwide, right? It would be like Kenya or Haiti or something like that. In this particular case, because this was written about a global phenomena, they use worldwide. And then you have the title there, Alternative Analysis, The Next 12 Months of COVID. So that indicates the kind of product it is, an alternative analysis. And then The Next 12 Months of COVID-19 uh, is the title. And like I was saying, for government uh, reports, you don't necessarily have to be, uh, you know, you don't have to have a, like a headline you know, a newspaper style headline, eye-catching kind of thing. 
because presumably the the sorts of senior people that this intelligence report is going to are, at least in March 2020, extremely interested in what the next 12 months is going to look like in terms of COVID. Uh, so that's so that's sort of a quick guide to to the front matter. So moving on, right? Let's get into introductions. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because this introductions share probably the most the most in common with uh, traditional essays or articles and things like that. But basically, the function of your introduction text is to summarize the key findings of the report for busy readers. A lot of times, the the people who are going to be reading your report, whether that's you know private sector, the public, or an intelligence official, they're going to have a lot on their plate. They're going to be managing a lot, especially if they're a decision maker. There's going to be a lot of different things competing for their time and a lot of stressors. And so the 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 sort of plain and simple truth is often when you hand an intelligence report to someone, you can't guarantee that they're going to read the whole thing all the way through. Sometimes they're just going to read uh, the title and the introduction and then maybe skip around to uh, something that interests them, either because, you know, they're busy or because it's it's not important to them. Ultimately, you know, you're working for them, so they get to call the shots about how they engage with your report. So there are two ways to approach doing an introduction text. In theory, you know, in theory, these are these are very separate. In practice, people kind of abuse abuse the limits to them. But I wanted to sort of explain how they're different in theory so that you could recognize them out in the wild. Uh, the first is a bluff or a bottom line up front. This one is particularly prone to being like overused or misused. So anytime that there is like an introduction anywhere sometimes uh, it'll just be labeled as a bluff even though it, it it really it really isn't basically the point of your bluff is the the shortest possible version of of your intelligence report you know if you're passing someone in a hallway basically you know by the time they can hear you versus when you by the time you've walked by them uh, that's how long right you would be you would be explaining something uh your the core of your intelligence report that's what you want to get across in your bluff so that means like maximum one paragraph of writing, ideally one sentence of writing. And, you know, that can be a little bit frustrating uh, because you're basically cutting out, you know, the vast, vast, vast majority of your content. But, if you know, the idea is that if someone's busy and you, and you have one thing that you absolutely need to get across that will inform their decision making uh, in the short term, that's what you're putting in the bluff. And, you know, you'll see examples uh, out in the wild of other intelligence reports where it'll be you know, a bluff and it'll be several paragraphs long. You know, that's more in line with what I'm going to talk about next, which is uh, an executive summary. And, you know, executive summaries can go by all kinds of names, right? You can you can just put summary if you want or introduction, right? But the idea is that this is more like your traditional um, report introduction, right? So it's longer. Uh, I would say max one page um, because because otherwise you're sort of stretching uh, stretching the attention of someone who's very busy and they might end up not reading the entire introduction. But I've seen reports, right, that are if they're like 40 pages long, uh, they end up stretching their executive summary to, to three or four pages. But because of that, right, because of that added length, um, even if it's even if it's just, you know, one page, you get to add a lot more than the bluff. Right. So you can add a little bit more context. You can add a little bit more of your evidence. You can add a little bit more of uh, caveats if you have them. Basically, you have a little bit more room to breathe. The the trick is, though, making sure that you understand what and what information in your report is going to be most important to the person who's reading it, right? You're not just writing this report to to demonstrate what you've learned. You're writing to give the person who's going to read it a decision advantage, right? So keep that. So sort of keep that in mind and be a little bit brutal when it comes to writing, whether it's a bluff or an executive summary, keeping it as short as possible, as to the point as possible. So this is a, an introduction example, right? This is an executive summary uh, from the National Drug Threat Assessment 2011. This is a U.S. government product. The office that produced it left, or, or rather was disbanded in 2012 and sort of broken into a bunch of different organizations, uh, which is why I chose the 2011 one, because that was the last one they made. But basically what it does is it outlines trends and patterns in the use of illicit drugs in the United States. So you can you can see there's a bit of an overall first paragraph, and then uh, as you go through, uh, they break down trends in use for individual kinds of drugs, right? Like uh, like marijuana or or CBDs, and and stuff like that. There it goes on for a couple more pages, but I just wanted to include this first one to to get this idea across, right? That at the end of the executive summary, 
you shouldn't have the reader shouldn't have every single thing about the report down, but they should have the core ideas down, right? Like the core concepts. And, and that's sort of what you're aiming to get done. Now, the body of your report, which is also the body of uh, this presentation. You know, the, the body of report, it's, it's sort of hard to describe, but I mean, basically it conveys, the body of intelligence report usually conveys your relevant assessments, your intelligence assessments, which we'll go through, and uh, your evidence to the reader, right? So the things you want to include in the body of your report, and I'll go through these one by one, right, are your assessments and judgments, uh, your supporting evidence for those assessments and judgments, uh, visual elements, right, like like maps or pictures and stuff like that, and then uh, structured analytic techniques, which are uh, almost a small category to themselves that I'll explain more later. But for now, let's let's get into assessments. Some of you might not have heard of assessments, or you might know them as key judgments, or you might you know have seen them conceptually, but maybe just didn't have a have a word to put to them. Assessments are the centerpiece of a report. They are, they are the most valuable part of the report for the reader, and it's the most valuable thing that you make as an analyst. What an assessment is, is it's a conclusion that an analyst reaches and makes based on the evidence. Without an assessment, your report is basically just a summary of all the stuff you researched, right? You're not adding your analysis into it. You're just sort of presenting a bunch of stuff that you collected together. In, in a report, right, in the process of, of sort of coming up with the content for a report, usually the assessment's the last thing you do, right? Because you've gotten, you've gathered all your evidence, you've gone through all your evidence, and then you've come to your, you know, you've come to your conclusion about it. That's the last step of the process, but you should make sure that your assessment, and, and there are exceptions to this, but try and make sure that your assessment is the first thing that the reader sees in the body of your report. And the reason for that is because if they read your conclusion first, right, if they read your assessment first, then when they look at all of the evidence, they think of that evidence in terms of, okay, this, this supports the conclusion they've come to. Otherwise, you're sort of taking them in this roller coaster ride, like through the evidence and stuff. This, this isn't an episode of like Oro, right? This isn't a detective mystery game. You need to be upfront with what your conclusions are. So that's why the assessment comes first. And Assessments are usually phrased um, in a very specific way, at least in sort of the U.S. And, and in sort of NATO standard countries. Assessments typically use what is called probabilistic language to express uncertainty. So probabilistic language is words like likely or probably or unlikely or almost certainly. And, and this allows you to talk about, as an analyst, to talk about what will happen or things that you're not certain about in your analysis. Right, but as you, 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 no one can predict the future yet. Uh, so, so you know, you can't say I know for sure that this is going to happen. But you can say I've looked at all the evidence. I'm fairly sure that this is going to happen. And you know, an example would be: it is likely that X country will pursue Y policy in the next six months. So, the probabilistic language there is the word likely. And so, when you're reading an intelligence report or when you're writing an intelligence report. The use of the word likely isn't just rhetoric. It's not just something you're saying. It's, it's, uh, it has an actual specific value. And that value, and this goes into the probability yardstick that I mentioned earlier, that value is usually quantified roughly, right? So in our example, we use the word likely. This is, this is the UK DI's probability yardstick. Likely or probable under this yardstick, if I said something is likely to happen, that means 55% to 75%. And don't uh, obsess or worry too much about the specifics when it comes to the statistics. You know, don't don't worry too much if something's like 79% or 80%. The idea is to give sort of a rough idea of how certain you are. You know, from like, uh, you know, it's more likely than not to, oh, we're pretty sure to, oh, definitely not. Or almost definitely not. Yeah, it's, it's um, yeah, so don't, yeah, don't worry. Don't worry too much about the, the sort of specifics of those statistics, it's more about, you know, what can you defend? So if you go to your supervisor with, you know, an assessment that's, you know, something's highly likely to happen, as long as you can explain where you're coming from and why you think it's highly likely, and you're willing to to take on board if they come back and they say, oh, this thing has happened since and this makes it less likely, you know, that as long as as long as you're flexible about that and you're willing to explain where you're coming from, no one's really going to question, you know, your your decisions there. And to be frank, on the reader side, when when the um, when the intelligence consumer is actually reading the report, usually they'll read likely and highly likely as basically the same. 
Uh, but you know, it's important that it's important that you get it right on your end. Um, but often they don't even make this distinction. So here are some examples of assessments, right? Uh, I gave an example with the hypothetical, but these are actual assessments that Gray Dynamics has put out. And this and these are not uh, current, by the way. These are from uh, a selection of products across time. And you can see where that probabilistic language uh, comes into play, right? So for the first one, it was about the first report was about Kenya, right? And so one of the assessments in there was Al-Shabaab will likely exploit Kenyan social disparity to bolster its recruiting efforts in the next six months. The analyst, the analyst who wrote it can't know, right, that this is what's going to happen, but they're more, it's more likely than not that this will happen. So they use the term likely, and this adds value for the intelligence consumer because, you know, maybe they, maybe they would come to that conclusion if you, if you slapped all the evidence in front of them that supports this assessment. Maybe they would come to the same conclusion, but it's a lot faster to give them this conclusion and then the evidence below it. And it's the same for the other two, right? Opposition parties will, for example number two, right? Opposition parties will likely interpret Togo's constitutional reform as a ploy to execute a seizure of power. This is, this is a very similar case. A lot of times, likely is the most common phrase analysts will use. And that's because you're, you're sort of towing the line between, being, between adding value and being safe. If you make a really safe assessment, it's not actually that useful. Like a big, a big, not mistake, but a big missed opportunity you'll often see in assessments is people will say, uh, the thing that's happening will, will likely continue to happen. And you're sort of missing a lot of, uh, you're missing a lot of value there because most people assume that something that is happening will continue to happen um, in most circumstances. Uh, and it's the same for that last one. Uh, in this case, the analysts used um, highly likely. And and in this case, right, when they present the evidence, there would probably be a stronger set of evidence supporting that Ghana will increase its international cooperation in the next six months versus those other two. And so they're more comfortable making a, a stronger assessment there. Yeah. Okay. So we've been talking, I've been talking a lot about evidence <laughs> in, in the assessment section, but but this this is sort of to focus on the role of your evidence, like in your intelligence report, right? And you need to gather lots of evidence as an analyst, but not all of that evidence is going to be relevant or, or useful in the report, right? Sometimes you need to cast a wide net to get at what's important. Sometimes you're, you're constantly monitoring stuff, right? And then a set of information comes in that's sort of worth writing an intelligence report about. Just because you did all of that research doesn't mean all of the research that you did should be reflected in the intelligence report. The evidence that's listed in your report needs to directly relate to the assessment. So, you know, if you, if you don't do that and, and, and you sort of take them in a, in a, on a loop-de-loop -loop around a bunch of different ideas and concepts, it's going to confuse the reader. It's going to lose focus as a product, because, as, a, as a report, because the, the reader is going to go off in all these different directions and they're going to get farther and farther away from what you're trying to tell them, which is, you know, we think this is going to happen. Here's, here's the evidence that supports why we think that. In complex reports, right, like, uh, you know, reports that are 100, 200 pages, you can't, you can't always do that directly. And in that case, it's good to make use of subheadings, right, to connect the evidence to your assessments. Oftentimes, you can use the assessment itself as a subheading, and then that connection is made for them. But in, 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 in really long reports, for instance, if you have a background section, right, that gives a little bit of necessary background history uh, to an event, you can use a subheading to say background to such and such, right? And that will and that will make that connection for them. It, when when you're writing your evidence out, I, I think in like the vast majority of reports, it'll be in bullets or paragraphs. And I think there's a there's a little bit of a misunderstanding where people think that if something is in bullets, uh, that it should be shorter than paragraphs. Um, for intelligence reports, at least, that's not the case. In both instances, you should use as short and as succinct language as you possibly can. And, you know, I could, I could do a whole presentation on just the ways that, that people should write intelligence reports in English. But the long and short of it is, whatever language you write your intelligence report in is, you need to make sure that you have as good a handle on that language as you possibly can. It's not just a matter of, you know, being a, being a literary scholar or something like that. It's, it's, more about, it's more about making sure that you're conveying your ideas and your evidence as clearly and simply as possible, because you can't guarantee that your intelligence consumer is going to be on the same page as you if you write, if you write a sort of complicated sentence, right? Often, 
you know, often people, the most writing experience that people had, especially for people who are on the newer side to intelligence, is writing essays, right? Like writing essays for school. When when you write essays for school, often you're writing basically for yourself and for the teacher, right, to demonstrate something. In intelligence, you're you're only writing for someone else, right? You're not you're not writing for yourself. You're not writing to to get a good grade, right? And that person needs to take away as much as they possibly can from it. And so, even if that person is, you know, let, you know, let's say they're an engineer, right? And they're and they're not much of a reader, and you know, their their focus has mostly been on math. And you're and you're talking about, you know, now you're talking, you're telling them about geopolitics, right? They're the CEO of an engineering firm. You need to make sure that you're communicating to that CEO of the engineering firm as clearly as possible so they so they get what's happening right so they understand what the content of your report is but let's move on to some examples here so this is from a i think it's from 2008 it's a US government declassified product analyzing a statement that Osama bin Laden uh, the then leader of al qaeda had made to the media right and so at the very top in the bolded text Right, you can see that there is an assessment. Right, you can see the use of the word "likely" there. So, so we know that that's the assessment, right? Because it's using that probabilistic language. Make sure you don't use probabilistic language in your evidence because that will confuse the reader and it makes you seem less certain about your evidence that you know you're introducing evidence that you yourself aren't sure about. So, try and avoid using "likely" and "probably" anywhere but your assessments. And you can see below it in the bullets, or I guess in this case, dashes. Right, how the evidence connects to that uh, assessment at the very top, right? So, so the first, the first, the first bullet, you know, talks about uh, talks about what Bin Laden said, and sort of discussed uh, the content of it itself. Uh, the second bullet uh, discusses uh, what a different uh, person in the same organization said, uh, and how and how these are different, right? So these these lead into uh, these lead into together. They lead into a better understanding and support the uh, assessment at the top. This second example is from one of our products. Uh, I would have screenshotted it, but uh, it doesn't really look good on PowerPoint because it's a white background and, and the website's a black background, so it would have been, uh, it was tough on the eyes. But so like that, like that official report, right? Like in our report, uh, we have that top line assessment, right? It is highly likely that Russia will increase its use of drone technology. And then we have four pieces of evidence, right? So the first piece of evidence is the president of Russia said that he was going to increase the procurement of drones, right? That's a fairly good piece of evidence, uh, you know, to to underpin uh, the idea that Russia is going to be using more drones. Um, and then and then the next bullet is a growing trend in Russian use of drones, uh, which also supports that idea. And then Russia making more drone factories. And then um, and then another bullet about um, how many drones were used in the most recent month for when this report is written. Um, and, you know, maybe maybe, you know, if you were. Um, if you were inventive, you could combine bullets two and four, but you can see how each of these bullets uh, builds to something, right? They make a foundation of evidence, and that lead that led the analyst to make that assessment. And so, when the person, when the when the intelligence consumer reads it, they read that key judgment. They understand they understand what the key judgment is, and they see how each of the evidence relates to it. Uh, if you'd done it the other way around, they would basically just spend the whole the whole time going, "Where is this going? Where is this going? Where is this going?" And then you would have to um, do some heavy lifting either in the introduction or in the uh, the title to explain it, and that's a big waste of time. Right, so visual elements. This is my favorite part because I get to show a lot of pictures. But, <laughs> but you know, it's not just that I like pictures. It's, it's that, you know, graphics in an intelligence report communicate really, really complicated ideas way more succinctly than, than written bullets or paragraphs, particularly uh, evidence that has to do with, like, lots of data or trends, or um, you know, lots of individual points of data that's sort of wordy to explain, um, but that we can naturally see um, and understand in a visual format, right? So the first, you know, the first example would be a map, right? A map is a great way to show the locations, so so the reader understands where they are geographically, as well as uh, as well as incidents, right? You know, if you were if you had a map of New York. Right, and you are looking at the total number of uh, hot dog sales in New York. This is uh, this is this is kind of a silly example, but you know, if if all if there was a big if there was a big increase in in sales right in one section of Manhattan, Manhattan Island, um, on a map, 
right? You could you could either explain that right over paragraphs and paragraphs of explaining trends and explaining how there's an increase in one place, or you can slap a big map up there. And even if even if the the intelligence consumer is busy and they're just and they're just skimming through, they can see very clearly. Oh, there's a concentration of dots in this area that you know that's that's notable, right? And and it, it's a little bit more impactful than just it's more impactful than than describing it. Like you're you're making something that's kind of abstract feel a bit real. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about was charts, like charts and graphs. These are good for two reasons. Um, the first is the more obvious one, right? Showing trends in data. You know, you could tell someone you could tell someone that uh, there's been a three hundred percent increase in some event happening. But if you show them right, like a chart or a graph, and you see that line, you know, going really high up or really or really low down or behaving in in some other way, you know, they instantly get it, right? Most of us most of us have seen lots of charts before. We instinctually know how to read them. Uh, it gets your idea across very clearly and. And, you know, it's not going to explain everything, right? You might still need writing below it to offer more context or to get at why you're seeing those trends in the data. But the, it helps with engagement, right? Because they've seen that trend and then they're curious about it and they go through and read it. The other thing you can use it for, and this is very, very common, is um, to help understand organizations better or explain how organizations are structured better. You know, you can think of if you've seen like a lot of like cop movies or mafia movies. Uh, you can think about, you know, when they're in the police station and they have like the the board, right, with like the mob boss on top and his capos and his soldiers and his affiliated uh, and his affiliated members of the organized crime organization. That's a really, really useful way to communicate very quickly who's in an organization and what their relationships are to each other. Right. It doesn't just have to be organized crime. It could be, you know, if your principal, right, if your intelligence consumer, if they're about to go you know, have a visit with uh, with a meeting with a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, right? Uh, you could present them with a chart, right, that has uh, the person, the other, your their opposite, right, Minister of Foreign Affairs, and then also like their deputy directors or their deputy ministers and stuff like that, and all the way down through who they'll be meeting. This also works for organizations as well, right? Uh, if you know one one department is in charge of another, is in charge of another office, is in charge of another secretariat, it's just a very easy way to explain that. The last one I'm going to talk about is images, and this is both uh, images in terms of like taking a picture with your phone and imagery, as in like geospatial satellite imagery. Often, you know, this this isn't necessarily a way to condense lots of information, like the last two examples, but often it's a super impactful way to get a message across. Right? If if you think about if you think about uh, a natural disaster hitting, you know, hitting a hitting a locality. Uh, you could write, you know, twenty percent of the buildings, twenty percent of the buildings are destroyed, forty percent of buildings are damaged, you know, forty uh, percent are are unharmed. That's, you know, that's that's a, that's you know, intellectually, you can read that and you can understand, right, the the scale of damage. But if you show uh, either, you know, uh, footage from a camera, right, or if you show satellite imagery that shows, you know, a, a devastated town or locality. That is much more effective and much more impactful because the the intelligence consumer is seeing with their own eyes, you know, uh, something something that is difficult to explain with words to sort of capture the to capture the the impact right of the natural disaster. Yeah, and and another example right where images come in handy is particularly visual investigations. Um, these are becoming more and more common just because you see more and more organizations doing social media analysis, like the New York Times does it, for instance. Um, the Defense Intelligence Agency put out. A good example where they looked at North Korean missiles uh, used in Ukraine, and they looked at North Korean missiles in North Korea, right? And they used those images to show, hey, this part here looks like this part of debris there, and that's a, a much better way to communicate that that these are the same item than uh, if you sat someone down and had them read a paragraph about how they like you know the dorsal fin looks similar, right? So let's go through some examples, right? And these are all from ours. Uh, mainly because images tend to be, uh, you know, copyrighted or contextual. So on the left here, uh, we have a chart, right, of the UK's intelligence community, right? So the major intelligence services. And you can see that it's a pretty effective way to explain what where the agencies uh, fit, right, within the broader UK government, right? So you have the prime minister at the top, and then you have the secretaries, right, um, FCDO, Home Secretary and Defense Secretary, and then some of the ancillary um, organizations. And so you can look at this quite quickly and see, oh, you know, uh, the security service, right, MI5, 
is uh, is under the Home Secretary, right, and is under the Prime Minister. This is this is a fairly simple version of this. Um, this is sort of aimed at folks who might not know too much about the UK intelligence community. You can you can always scale up or down a chart, uh, the detail um, based on who you're writing it for. So if someone's interested in you know, way more detail, way more specificity. You can always grow it, right? It's just a matter of understanding your audience. On the right is uh, represents a lot of work that I had to do and, and we had to do. It is a map of the armed factions in and around Tripoli um, as of March 2024. We essentially wrote a big report outlining each of these organizations, but <laughs> but we realized that you sort of need to represent them visually because unless you already know a lot about the geography of Tripoli, it doesn't mean anything to say that the Janzor Knights Battalion is based in Janzor because you don't know where that is. So, you know, this is a good example of a map uh, that both that, that shows, you know, where these armed, armed factions are and where they are in relation to each other. So the, the plan there, the, well, the, not the plan, it's, you can go online and see it, is that it's at the top. And so you can see it first. And then as you go down and read through the report, you can always scroll back up and look at it again. One, one key tip for using maps in an intelligence an intelligence report is that if you mention a location, uh, you should try and have it on the map within reason, right? Like if 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 our report on Tripoli mentions France, you don't need to include France, right? But if you're you know you're if you're including the you know the headquarters of the Third Infantry Company, you should try and include the headquarters of the Third Infantry Company on the map, just so they so the reader can locate things. Um, it makes things a lot easier for them. Just two more, just two more quick visual examples. On the left, you have satellites launched by African countries. This is older. I think it's from like twenty twenty, but basically, it's an effective way to communicate a which countries are launching satellites and give you a sense of which countries are launching more satellites. So, uh, you know, just looking at this map, right? You, you know, Egypt, Algeria, Nigeria, and South Africa stand out, right? Because the list is longer for them. Um, and, you know, obviously you're not getting as much detail as, as you would in the paragraph. And, you know, there's a, there's a wider report around it, but it's a very quick snapshot, very useful and very effective. And it's the same for the image on the right, which is sort of a cross, uh, a sort of card style graphic of the Bayraktar TB2 drone, which is, uh, a Turkish drone that's, uh, growing in popularity worldwide, uh, particularly among, uh, countries that, uh, this is this is sort of countries that are interested in acquiring drones, but didn't have um, the resources and the technology to do so until recently. You know, this card doesn't tell you every single thing about the Bayraktar TB2, right? It's part of the broader report. But if an you know an intelligence consumer is going through it and they're and they're looking and they're they're sort of skimming through it and they're just looking for you know quick quick facts or or a really fast set of information. They're gonna they're going to benefit um, from seeing this this graphic where all of the you know a big set of the information is sort of uh, just just lined up like that. And then the last example, this is from a report we did on uh, the Iranian Navy. This is imagery satellite imagery of Bandar Abbas naval base, and you can see here that uh, you know if you're you know I could I could describe this base to you right uh, in either in writing or out loud. Um, but it is helpful to just to just actually be able to look at it, right, and see where the ships are, see which ships of note there are. If you're, you know, not a naval person, uh, you get a sense of how large these vessels are compared to each other or to uh, civilian vessels. One thing to note here, this is also true for maps, is uh, the legend right on the top left. Just making sure that you put in sort of the vital pieces of information, like in this case, the coordinates are there, so you could go and look up this location later. That doesn't necessarily need to happen for this particular naval base because it's it's um it's a well-known location right but if it's imagery of you know somewhere in the middle of nowhere you know you might you might have trouble finding it if you don't have those those coordinates listed there and also uh, for imagery specifically the date of capture is really important because ships don't tend to stay in one place right they famously uh, leave leave harbor and go out to sea so it, you know the point of the intelligence product is not to say this is what's, you know, this is what's there now. It's to say that this is what was here as of 1 May 2023. Right. So the the last part of the body uh, that I wanted to talk about is what's called, what are called structured analytic techniques. And structured analytic techniques are <laughs> uh, a very, a very wide, very wide topic to talk about. They They essentially refer to a 
a whole bunch, like hundreds of different formal methods that intelligence analysts use to interpret and to analyze information. Up until SATs came along, uh, they're sort of, and that's like the 80s and 90s, and and even still today, um, because not everyone uses them. Analysts typically would gather all of the relevant information, and they would either have a discussion about it, or they would, you know, think really hard, and they would just intuit, you know, their assessment of it. They would into they would they would come to a conclusion, right? The the issue with that is, uh, firstly, because it's all happening inside your head, it's not it's difficult to explain to other people how you came to that conclusion. And two, you you're affected by your own perception, right? By your own cognitive biases. And that's not like a, you know, that's not like a political thing. That's just uh, the way that people tend to interpret and process information. Um, it is subject to several biases. For instance, uh, you're more likely to accept a piece of evidence coming in if you already think that that's what's happening. So if you're looking at, you know, a conflict and you think that that, that one side in that conflict is winning and a piece of evidence comes in that says, you know, that side is winning, you're you're more likely to accept that as true versus a report that says the opposite right? That the side that you think is winning is actually losing. And that's, you know, that's something that analysts have been battling for as long as there's, there have been analysts. But the long, and sh- the long and short of it is analysts and intelligence officials have come up with what are called structured analytic techniques or SATs to, uh, to try and formalize this process a bit so that supervisors or, or your peers can reflect on, you know, the analysis you've done. And there's, there's all different kinds of SATs you know, from from stuff as simple as brainstorming to what we're going to talk about here, which is SATs that can form an entire intelligence report unto themselves. And this is usually the case for SATs to do with forecasting the future. Um, you know, the process of doing uh, an SAT like that is is lengthy, but but often it can form the body of an intelligence report and be and be useful to the reader in that context. So, like the the prime example. It's, uh, is what's called scenarios analysis. Scenarios analysis is about as simple as it gets. Um, the analyst looks at, you know, five, between three and five, usually, uh, potential futures. You know, say that, you know, if you say, what's the future of U.S. relations with Russia or something, right? You come up with with between three and five different scenarios, and you 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 just talk about the implications, right, of each of those. Um, and ideally their likelihood and sort of rank them, right? Like here's the most likely, here's what it means if this most likely one comes to pass. And then you go down the line for all the other scenarios. Another, another, uh, and that, and that's a very common report style, a less common one, but one that I think is actually pretty interesting is backcasting. And, uh, this would be a case where, you know, let's say you're, you're, you know, you're working for, uh, you're working as an analyst for a company and the company's very concerned about one potential future. Even if it's not the most likely one, they, they go, you know, if things turn out this way, it's, it's terrible, it's catastrophic for our, for our business. Um, so I want to, you know, I want to understand how we might get there, right? If in, the, in that case, right, you would do what's called backcasting, which is you start, you start from that event happening in the future, and you, get, and you basically work through the most logical chain of events back to the present. And the idea isn't that, you know, you're predicting the future, you're just trying to gain more insight into the circumstances that would lead to this, you know, this bad or this terrible thing happening. And that's useful to the intelligence consumer because now they know at least a bit, you know, what to look out for. And it's similar with what-if analysis. So what-if analysis uh, is a little bit like backcasting because you sort of take a, an unexpected or unpredictable event. A good example would be like uh, a volcanic eruption in Iceland say that takes down, you know, that prevents, you know, air traffic from, uh, from traveling, you know, that's obviously very disruptive to the global economy. It could have security implications, right? So, so unlike backcasting, which is more about, you know, how did they get to the point of the volcano erupting? A what if scenario would be, okay, the volcano has erupted. Here's what it means, right? It has this implication for law enforcement, that implication for, uh, Delta airlines, et cetera. The last one I'm going to talk about here is what's called red teaming. And this this has a bunch of different variations and names. The idea with red teaming is you are, if, if there's a topic that your intelligence organization or your office or even you has written a lot of different, you know, intelligence reports on, there tends, there tends to be almost a, a bit of a consensus that develops about, you know, what this topic is, where this topic's going in sort of a macro sense. 
the idea with red teaming is that you'd write a report specifically trying to challenge and present the opposite perspective. And uh, by doing so, you would expose any sorts of assumptions or weaknesses or flaws in all of those other intelligence reports. And like 90%, 99.9% you know, of the time, the, the red teaming analysis isn't a more believable report than all of the other reports. But it is still useful to do that because you're stress testing your analysis. So maybe it'll prompt you to, to sort of rethink uh, some, of the, some of the assumptions you have about an issue. So, so all of those, all those scenarios and a couple, all of those kinds of SATs and several more can form the body of an intelligence report in, in and of themselves. And so that's why I brought it up, because these wouldn't necessarily be structured like what we've been describing so far. Uh, they would probably have their own, you know, their own special template or their own special layout. Um, often you can use assessment language in them, uh, but it might look a bit different because you're not assessing you know, for, especially for forecasting, you're not assessing the future, you're assessing what would happen if this event happened. Uh, so there's there's a little bit more of a speculative element to that. And that's okay, right? That's why we have like the labels and stuff like that. So that when an intelligence consumer picks it up, they don't assume that this is what, you know, this is necessarily what you actually believe, right? Because you're, you're indicating this is, you know, this is an alternative analysis, this is exploratory, this is more speculative, it's more to get the noggin joggin, so to speak. Yeah. So, so yeah. Just a quick example here. Um, this is a paper from a paper and intelligence report from uh, the U.S. government from the 1980s uh, that's since been declassified. It talks about scenarios for a confrontation between the U.S. and Iran. They, how how times have changed. Very uh, very different from now, um, surely. But I I did some I did some very professional underlining as you can see there. But basically, this report. Right, it it examines five scenarios uh, for how the current situation might develop, and and basically it just goes through them one by one. So this is just a section of a section of the first page, right? But you know, U U.S. tanker escorts withdrawn under pressure at the time. Um, at the time, one of the big problems that the U.S. was having with Iran was Iran was attacking tanker ships, right? It was um, so that's so that's one of the one of the scenarios that they discuss. And then, you know, tensions diffuse uh, and then they go all the way down the line from, you know, everything being fine to to an outright conflict. Um, one thing I would like to highlight, though, is that, you know, in this report, they say it's not intended to predict the outcome or rank the likelihood when you're doing when you're doing an intelligence report, always try and think of ways to maximize value to the reader. Um, and when it, when a scenarios analysis is usually more helpful to suggest the most likely one first, because if you just list five uh, potential scenarios, it looks like you don't really know what's going to happen. And so the the reader has less confidence in in you because it, it seems like you don't, even if you do, right? It seems like because you're presenting all these different scenarios and saying, well, I don't know which one's going to happen. It, it, sort of un, it sort of undermines you a little bit. Um, so try and, you know, let, rank it by you know, least li most likely to least likely, for instance, or just, you know, or pick one scenario, for instance. Right. So concluding a report, unlike like a school essay or, you know, a, a newspaper article or an academic paper, most intelligence reports don't need like a concluding paragraph that, that restates the ideas of the report. Um, this is because ideally the, your introduction would do that because an intelligence report front loads all of your conclusions um, for the reader, and then the reader goes through all of the evidence, you, you, don't, you don't need to wrap a bow, you don't need to tie a bow on it, really. But there are some things that people will put at the end of reports uh, that, that add value. One of the most common ones is policy recommendations. You particularly see this from like NGOs and, uh, and private sector. Um, some government organizations don't like it when analysts put policy recommendations because uh, you're, you're offering they they see they they perceive it as you're offering decision support you're not making the decision and many analysts don't want to make the decisions because uh you know the decision makers make the big bucks and so they should they should be able to uh they should be able to make uh, the decisions for themselves right but often you know there's an advocacy element in the private sector or in uh NGOs or humanitarian organizations when they put out reports like this or sometimes clients will ask uh, and this has happened to, to us in Great Dynamics where clients will ask for a set of recommendations, right? So, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to doing that, you know, just, just think about what recommendations will be the most useful. They can range. You don't have to solve 
you know, whatever, whatever the issue is. Sometimes the recommendation can just be, we recommend continuing to monitor this or, or, or something like that. You know, just, just that idea that, um, that, that idea that, that you're providing them with, uh, policy recommendations that are useful and actionable as opposed to like, you know, solve world hunger, right? You can say deliver, you know, make sure that you're able to safely deliver food from this town to this town. Yeah. So, so scope it, scope it according to the needs and the capabilities of, um, of your intelligence consumer. The other thing to add are uh, what I what I sort of termed caveats and disclaimers, and we'll show an example after this. But what we do in our reports is we do what's called an analytic summary, and that's an opportunity for the analyst at the end of the intelligence report to reflect a bit on uh, the nature of the sources they used. Right, if they were more reliant on uh, human intelligence versus social media intelligence versus geospatial intelligence, or or to do you know. Uh, to do something like reflect on any assumptions they might have made or consider alternatives. Basically, an opportunity for the analyst to talk a bit about the process of writing the intelligence product. Often, intelligence consumers don't read these. I think they should. Um, I think it's actually it's actually um, quite important for them to read it, uh, but they often don't. But it's also useful for you as an analyst to write this out. And uh, the reason for that is because the process of reflecting on your intelligence reports helps you write better intelligence reports of the future or identify a problem with this intelligence report that you can then solve before it gets in front of um, the person who's reading it. So, so yeah, it is, it is useful to, to have that stuff. And then last but not least, sources. Um, that's not, you know, that's, that's fairly straightforward. Essentially, you have a piece of evidence, uh, you know, cite it cite it in a way that um, the intelligence consumer can find it or ask you to find it for them. Uh, this is useful for them. It's also useful for you if you keep writing reports about the same topic over and over, you know, over and over again, the same topic, uh, because sometimes, you know, the, you can't remember exactly where you found a piece of information from six months ago, but you can go back to that report and find it. One thing I will say is that when, and this goes into putting evidence uh, under assessments, um, if you have like 10 pieces of evidence uh, for a single assessment, but you only have like, say, three bullets, um, just try and pick the three best pieces of information, the three most like rock solid, stable pieces of information. You don't really impress an intelligence consumer by citing, you know, uh, 10 pieces of evidence if there's really only three important pieces uh, that really that really locks it in. The alternative is that you can cite, you know, two pieces of information in the same bullet through some through phrasing and stuff like that. But otherwise, just make sure you have a consistent style um, for referencing your sources that's uh, repeatable and you're, that you're able to reference. So this is the uh, this is an example uh, of our analytical summaries. You can see here. So so this is from a product that was about out an assessment of Norway's Norway's Arctic security in 2024. And so, and so it's just a short paragraph. You can see, you can see the analyst expresses, you know, that they have a high level of confidence in their assessment and that they base these assessments on Norwegian official intelligence reports and think tanks and testimony to the UK government and, and sort of reflecting on their sources, the alternatives that the analyst considered, and then why they didn't, they didn't go with that alternative. So, so reading this, right, going back, say a year later, right, if you're, if you're looking at your own intelligence reports and reading something like this. It's useful because you can see what played out and uh, and remember why you made the decisions you did and then hopefully come back as a stronger analyst. The last thing I want to bring up here is uh, what's called the intelligence cutoff date at the bottom. That's another thing you can include at the bottom at the conclusion of a report. All that does is it indicates to the, and it can also go to the front, I suppose, but usually it's at the bottom. And that just indicates to uh, the people reading it like it's not it's not really an expiration date, but it's the date in which no new information in which in which there's no longer new information coming in. Right. So if the cutoff date is the 20th of December and it's released and it's released the 29th of December, if you come back a year later and look at it and you go, hey, why didn't they include this event? You can check that cutoff date and say, oh, OK, uh, they weren't they weren't um, they weren't account. They, you know, they wrote this before uh, this event happened. So obviously they're not going to take it into account in their analysis. Right. So that's sort of the elements of an intelligence report from sort of the, the, the very start to the very end. Right. And, and you might have, you know, you might have sat through this and gone, you know, OK, you're 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 giving a lot of best practices. You're giving a lot of uh, recommendations and stuff. How strict are these? Right. How strict are these rules? 
And um, the truth, the, I mean, not the truth, but like, but like, they're not, they're not, they're not that strict, particularly because often as an analyst, you don't get to call the shots. It's, it's your client or it's your intelligence consumer or it's the organization you work for that often gets to call the shots about what elements to include or not include. You know, you could be the biggest fan of, of, you know, uh, of writing a bluff and they might say, no, we do this, you know, we do these reports uh, with a different style, with an executive summary style. You know, your role as an analyst is to, is to sort of roll with those punches and understand the purpose of these elements so that, you know, when, when you have to do one or when you have to apply one, you know, you, you know what it's for and how to get the most out of it um, for the intelligence consumer. And, you know, in a lot of instances, you will have a lot of leeway in how you approach uh, your intelligence report. Um, but even in those cases, always keep in mind that you're writing this for someone else to read, right? So if you have a, a long-term, if you're, if you're writing for the same set of people, right, the same set of intelligence consumers for, you know, several months, and you get to know them a little bit as people, you get to, you get to know how they react and the feedback they give to your intelligence reports, you know, maybe you'll notice that they respond better to one element than another, right? Maybe, maybe they really, really respond to one kind of visual versus another kind of visual, or they just prefer that you keep it as short and, and short, as short as possible and you don't bog it down with, with lots of images and stuff like that. Maybe they just want to read, you know, a, a one page, a one page report and, and move on. So basically, you know, this, the, this sort of part of the presentation ends where we started, right? You have to understand who you're writing for and make sure that your report reflects what they need to make their decisions.